Good morning. I'm Kimberly Allen, MIT's Director of Media Relations. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning as we introduce Sally Kornbluth, who we are excited to say has just been named 18th president of MIT. We're just about to get ready to get started, but a few brief logistical items up top. In a moment, we'll be joined by Diane Green, chair of the MIT Corporation, who will introduce Sally. Following some remarks from the president-elect, we'll open for Q&A. For those journalists with us here in person, if you have a question, please raise your hand and a member of the media relations team will pass a mic to you. Sarah on that side, Melanie on that side. For those of you joining us virtually, please raise your hand using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you'll be prompted to open your line when I call your name. With that, I'd like to welcome Diane Green, Chair of the MIT Corporation. Welcome, everybody, on this wonderful and historic day for MIT. I'm, it's, she said, I'm chair of the corporation, and our members are what's essentially our board of trustees. In February, President Raphael Reif announced he would step down after 10 years in the role. And at that point, the MIT Corporation launched a search to find the Institute's next leader. It's been eight and a half months of steady and rigorous work, an undertaking that allowed us to sift through over 250 candidates, to listen to the aspirations of every MIT department, student groups, staff groups, a great many alumni, and our corporation, and some two dozen leaders at other universities. That process helped us define a clear and consist consistent set of qualities that seemed essential for MIT's president. Even though we had four exceptional final candidates, Dr. Sally Kornbluth emerged as the strong and clear front runner. And to our immense gratification, the committee reached an easy and unanimous decision. Let me say a few words about Sally before I invite her to the podium. A distinguished university leader, researcher, and mentor, Dr. Kornbluth has served as provost of Duke since 2014, overseeing Duke's 10 schools and six institutes. Her academic honors include membership in the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Kornbluth is an extraordinary find for MIT. She's an exceptional administrator, widely respected for her ability to create an environment that breaks barriers and importantly, enables every student, faculty, and staff member to contribute at their highest levels. She is known for her judgment, plain spokenness, and integrity. Dr. Kornbluth arrives at the Institute with a deep understanding of MIT's strengths, and she's a widely respected scientist who responds to problems with exceptional creativity and who comprehends the considerable importance of basic science, technological innovation, and entrepreneurship. Her vision and profound humanity will serve us well as MIT builds on its long-standing efforts to confront the challenges faced by our species and our world. And now I'd like to enthusiastically invite MIT's next president to the podium, President-elect Sally Kornbluth. A warm welcome from MIT. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the warm introduction. I have enormous appreciation for the thoughtful way that you, John Jarvie, the Presidential Search Committee, and the Student Advisory Council approach the search process. It's really always a good sign when you leave a job interview actually wanting the job more. Now, of course, I could not be more grateful to all the members of the MIT Corporation and its Executive Committee for trusting me with the profound responsibility for leading MIT. As anyone knows who has ever held a major leadership role, 
it would be impossible to do the job without great support from your family. In my case, that's my husband, Danny, a superb scientist and always my greatest constructive critic and sounding board, and our two children, Joey, a medical student in California whom I dearly hope I can lure to Boston, and our son, Alex, who happens to be a PhD student here at MIT studying probabilistic computing. But the truth is, I'm here because of one other person who will never know it, the most transformative teacher of my life, the late Bill DeWitt. He was a biology professor at my undergraduate institution, Williams, and he taught a class I only took because I had to take some science to graduate. I was majoring in political science, and I desperately needed to fulfill my science distribution requirement. I wound up in his class on human biology and social issues, and for me, it changed everything. Suddenly, I found myself fascinated by how cells function. I signed up for every biology class I could possibly cram in before I graduated, and I wound up getting a fellowship to study genetics at Cambridge, the other Cambridge. Um, those two years in England introduced me to the subjects and the intellectual obsessions that would define my career, and they set me on the path that has brought me here to the doorstep of MIT. So that's how I became a scientist. It doesn't explain how I became a university leader. I confess that I first got into academic administration for entirely non-altruistic reasons. I was still early in my research career, and I really just wanted to attract better graduate students and have better core facilities. If I agreed to take an administrative role, I thought it might be able to lead to some structural improvements that would help me do these things. And in the end, it worked not only for my lab, but for other labs too. My career since then has been all about building on that idea. And I learned pretty quickly that on top of loving science, I really loved enabling the success of others. Over the years, I've mentored 31 PhD students, and they've gone on to successful careers all across the country, from higher ed to the biomedical industry. Or more broadly, I believe that I have helped the university lean into its own excellence as well. With the support of an outstanding team at Duke, we've been able to do a lot of important work. We developed and implemented a strategic plan for the university. We substantially expanded the faculty in science and engineering. And we took steps to improve the environment for our faculty of color and expanded hiring. We worked to improve the quality of life and learning for graduate students. We enhanced campus residential life so every undergraduate would have a social and academic home in the place that they lived. And all those ideas emerged from extensive conversations with the Duke community. I want to approach the MIT community the same way. I went to want to spend time really getting to know the people and the institution. I want to hear the full range of views and perspectives, and I want to help the people of MIT make MIT even better. I've really loved my life and my roles at Duke. I've had lots of reasons to stay, and really no reasons pushing me to leave, which tells you the strength of the pull I felt drawing me to MIT. It was overwhelming to see how much people loved the place and how proud they were to be part of it. For someone who enjoys enabling the success of other people, it was impossible to resist the opportunity to do that for the extraordinarily talented people of MIT. And maybe above all, I was drawn here because this is a moment when humanity faces huge global problems, problems that urgently demand the world's most skillful minds and hands. In short, I believe this is MIT's moment. I could not imagine a greater privilege than helping the people of MIT seize its full potential. And I, I can't wait to get started. Uh, and now I understand that we'll have a few questions. Kimberly? Thank you again, ah. <laughs> Sally and Diane. So exciting. So now we'll open the room to a few questions. As mentioned before, for those of, us, those of you with, here with us in person, if you have a question, just raise your hand. A member of the team will pass you a microphone and just state your name and outlet before asking your question. For those of you joining us virtually, raise your hand using the button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you'll be prompted to open your line when I call your name. Just wait a little second, and then what the room will hear you ask the question. OK. Are there any, any questions in the room? Shuli Jones, MIT Admissions Blog. 
Hi there, thanks for taking my question. So MIT is a huge university with many facets, but at its heart, literally and metaphorically, are its students, who are known for being unique and maybe even quirky. As you transition into your new role, how do you plan to learn about student life and student concerns on campus? So uh, I've always believed in a very open access policy. I've talked to hundreds of students at Duke and I intend to do the same at MIT. I really want to make myself available. You know, when I first get here, uh, I'm going to be out and about listening. I'm going to want student groups and student committees to come see me, talk about their concerns. Um, I think one of the things that I've enjoyed most at Duke has been um, really listening to the students and doing things to improve their life, and both socially and academically. And so that's very exciting to me. I have to say, though, that I love a group of students who think that building roller coasters and catapults is fun. This is, you know, the center of intellectual fun. And so I, I can't wait to get here and um, both see it in action, participate, and learn a lot more from the students here all about it. So thank you. All right, any more questions in the room? And f those of you on the Zoom, if you hit the raise hand button, we'll see your hand. Oh, don't be shy. Zach, MIT News. Thank you, yeah, Zach, man, MIT News. I'm just wondering as you've learned more about MIT's community, what has really struck you about it or surprised you that uh, has gotten you more excited to start this role? So I have to say it's been a whirlwind. Um, MIT has always held a, a, a place in my mind as just the premier science and technology university in the world, but obviously great strengths in, in, in arts and sciences, in management, uh, in architecture. And, you know, I, what has really struck me is this great potential for collaboration between all of these groups. Um, you know, most universities, people are happy and proud to be there, but Everybody I've talked to affiliated with MIT has been not only excited about their place at MIT, but about their colleagues, their ability to collaborate, their ability to interact. And you know, to me, that's absolutely the most fun thing of university life. So uh, I hope to be able to continue to leverage that, to build that at MIT so that all of the great technological and scientific discoveries are informed by, um, by policy, informed by humanities. Um, and, you know, I just see it as this, this fantastic potential for those interactions. All right, now we'll take one from the Zoom. Anna Mona, New York Times. Uh, hi, it's Anna Mona. Can you hear me, Kimberly? We can. You're in the room. Great. Um, so congratulations, Dr. Pornbluth. Um, you mentioned taking steps to improve the environment for faculty of color and to expand hiring. Could you talk about that a little bit? This is a kind of a, a time of heightened awareness of, of those kinds of issues of diversity. There's the affirmative action case before the Supreme Court. So um, if you could just expand on that a little, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Let me say up front that I think that the best communities tap into the full range of human talent, that a diverse community is the best community for discovery, for inquiry, and so this is gonna be a huge priority for me. Now, MIT, like many of its peers, have made strides, uh, particularly in the undergraduate student space, and you know, we can talk further about what a potential uh, court decision means in that regard. But let me just address for a moment um, the issue of greater diversity and inclusion among the faculty and also graduate students. So, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not difficult to understand how recruitment is difficult when you're talking to someone and they're going to be the only one in a discipline. One thing that I've done in my administrative career is tap into the broader expertise of the community, put out seed money for faculty, for students, to come up with programs that they feel will, inc will increase an inclusive environment. And so uh, at Duke, we put out uh, seed money to create uh, faculty-wide programs across all of the disciplines. There's a black writing group, there's a black think tank, and what that does is not silo individuals into their own small community. It creates a campus-wide group or multiple campus-wide groups where individuals feel like not only do they belong, 
but they have peers, and they have a broad, inclusive community. And this has really helped both retention and recruitment. Um, I think that it is going to be critical. Obviously, MIT will always follow the law, but it's going to be critical to think about ways, um, regardless of what comes out of a court decision, to maintain a diverse and vibrant environment. Because, again, that doesn't only benefit the individuals. Now, we'll say MIT does not engage in legacy admissions, that one in five uh, of the students here um, are first generation, and those are things that we have to lean into uh, going forward. I'm absolutely committed to building a more diverse and increasingly inclusive environment here at MIT. Thank you very much. Katie Mogg, Boston Globe. Hi there, congratulations again. Thank you. Um, my question for you is that women, including students and faculty, haven't always felt like they've had the same footing as men here, and especially as the second woman president of MIT and just a very accomplished woman in STEM, what do you think you'll do to address that? So a couple things. First of all, I think you know being a role model is important, not just me, but the other women faculty at MIT, uh, other women leaders at MIT. And I note now that the president, the provost, and the chancellor uh, will all be women. Um, so I think modeling that, modeling it in the classrooms, in labs, really reaching out to young women, students, graduate stu undergrad and graduate, um, to let them know that they can have a robust career in whatever they want, and really being encouraging. Um, you know, in my own case, I had very encouraging mentors that made all of the difference. And, you know, I switched from political science to science because the door was open to me. So another thing I think is that MIT has to have open programming for people who may not have a background in an area that could be important to them going forward, and to make sure that that entree is welcoming. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of a first impression in early days, but I've always believed that it's a responsibility for, of women who have had successful careers to help the next generation uh, come up. Again, if there are any questions for those of you participating virtually, don't be shy. Um, hit the raise hand button and we'll get that question in now. We have time for a couple more. I think you would just, oh, Zach, in the room. Yes, thank you. Um, have you gotten any advice for this new role that has really stuck with you and you're excited to carry out? Um, to learn, I think, I think a colleague here referred to it as quirky, to um, learn uh, the culture of MIT well. Don't really come in with you know, suppositions. Every institution has their own strengths, their own qualities, their own characteristics. And you know, I'll say, just to reflect, many years ago, um, I had the task of overseeing some aspects of clinical research uh, at Duke, and I'm not an MD, and I wasn't going to walk in and tell people how they should treat patients. I learned and I listened. And you know, coming to MIT, it's the same thing. The advice is not to make any you know, quick decisions, quick moves at first, really learn the environment, talk to a lot of people, and then use that uh, to, to inform a plan going forward. Alice Dragoon, Technology Review. Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear yes. me now? Hi, sorry, I was muted. This is Alice Dragoon. I edit MIT News, the alumni magazine. Um, welcome and congratulations, first of all. Um, my question is, as someone who will be bringing a fresh perspective to the Institute, what opportunities do you see for MIT to become an even better institution? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, again, I've, I've, since I've been, uh, I guess, president-elect for about 15 minutes, uh, I may not have a fully formed answer, but I will say, just alluding to one of my previous answers, you know, when I think about some of the major changes, the major uh, challenges in the world, for ex example, climate change, um, MIT is one of the few places where the scientific and technical expertise can be brought to bear, but also the humanistic and social perspectives. And I think there are a lot of places that can do one or the other, but I think being able to affect 
uh, a change in our course of climate change, for example, is going to require both. It's going to require new technical solutions, but it's also going to require changes in regulatory policies. It's going to require changes in the way people live in the world, the way people adapt to the changes, honestly, that have already taken place. And so I think MIT can be a leader in these, and is a leader already in many ways, in these uh, societal problems that require multiple collaborative perspectives to move forward. And I, I'm just really excited about that. And uh, that's something that I've already begun thinking about. And we'll want feedback uh, from my new colleagues at MIT. Thank you so much. All right. Um, this is our last call for questions on the Zoom and in the room. Do we have any more? Wow. Christina? Oh, Christina <laughs> Chen, the tech. Hi. Congratulations last again. Question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I had a question. So MIT is kind of undergoing a restructuring with the introduction of the College of Computing. And I was wondering how that factors in, I guess, to your vision of academics at MIT, um, especially because you emphasized all the other great programs we have. I guess, how do you see that working in concert with the new College of Computing? Yeah, so first of all, um, computing going forward now and going forward is core to almost everything that is going on in society. Um, and, you know, I think the structure, the creation of the College of Computing, not only gives a strong home, but also creates a natural collaboration. For instance, I know that EECS straddles both engineering and the College of Computing. These kind of um, uh, organizations where people have a foot in more than one home tend to lead to natural collaborations. So that's one thing. The other thing is, if I think about the strengths at MIT, um, for instance, if you look at the College of Computing and folks working on AI, that has obvious touch to cognitive neuroscience. It has obvious touch to ethics. And so the College of Computing can actually, in a way, be a convener and a nexus where different disciplines can interact um, in the service of moving computing forward to address society's greatest problems. So um, this is going to be important. I understand that a large number of the majors at MIT are computer science majors, and I want to make sure that they learn what they need to know to be successful in that field, but also touch on multiple other fields while they're here. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone in the room, all of you on Zoom, for helping us welcome Sally to MIT today. If you have any more questions after this, um, just email us at questions at mit.edu. We'll try to get you images and other materials throughout the day. Thank you again, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.